Welcome to St. Matthew's Midweek Lenten Service. This is Wednesday, March the 24th. We give thanks again for Pastor Mark Vitalis Hoffman, who will be presenting on another session in our Lenten series, Marked by Christ. Tonight's session will be another fine mess, Jesus' passion. This service will be followed by a Bible study on Pastor Mark's teaching accessed through a Zoom link. You may receive that link by emailing Pastor Kathy at pastorkathy at stmattlutheran.org. Right up until the very last minute, she'll be checking her email. There is also attached to this, there is a bulletin and a guide for the Bible study. Let us begin with our call to worship. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. Returning to the covenant God made with us in holy baptism, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Holy and gracious God, I confess that I have sinned against you this day. Some of my sin I know, the thoughts and words and deeds of which I am ashamed. But some are known only to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask forgiveness. Deliver and restore me that I may rest in peace. By the mercy of God, we are united with Jesus Christ, and in him we are forgiven. As children of God, you have been marked with the cross of Christ forever. You have been marked for life in Christ. Amen. We will now sing our hymn. <laughs> Grace and peace be to you, and welcome as we continue our Lenten journey here, uh, Marked for Life. And in this fourth session, 
Um, I've titled it Another Fine Mess. Uh, some of you may uh, remember that um, phrase from uh, Lowell, Laurel and Hardy from way back in the day. Um, what I'm talking about here in this session is going to be about the passion of Jesus. And we want to see in which way it really is another fine mess, a really saving mess for us and how this works out. Uh, let's review quickly here. Uh, in an earlier session there, I pointed out how uh, I understand Mark to be functioning as uh, something of a triptych, the way it's structured. Uh, we have the baptism um, at the very beginning, and uh, that leads into the note about John being arrested and later killed. Um, and that sets up this theme, this backdrop of uh, foreshadowing of Jesus's own uh, upcoming uh, death, um, even though he's just been declared God's son. In the middle, then, we have the transfiguration. It's framed on either side by these uh, passion uh, predictions or pronouncements that Jesus makes. Uh, but we see him momentarily here um, in all his glory. It's, uh, if Mark doesn't have a clear resurrection scene, this is the scene that gives us uh, something of a uh, anticipation of what Jesus in glory might look like. Um, so even though uh, he's uh, glorified, um, this picture here reminds us still that this is centered around the cross. And ultimately, then the crucifixion as well, where for the third time we hear um, Jesus being declared as God's son, but this time by the centurion instead. So together, those are setting up the, the framework for Mark, but we want to ask here this time, what was the main purpose of Jesus's ministry? In particular, as you can see from the structure I've sent out, I think it's focused around Jesus's death. Why did Jesus die? But that's not quite right. It isn't that Jesus died, it was that he was killed. So why was he killed? But even that, we want to be even more specific and note, why was Jesus crucified? This was a very particular form of death in the Roman Empire that um, was a way of highlighting uh, the shame, uh, highlighting Roman authority. Um, so it was making a point in a way that no other kind of uh, death would do here. Uh, to finish the story, we do want to also know why Jesus, why did Jesus rise again? And what difference does this all make for us here? And those questions about why Jesus died and why he was crucified, um, that's what we call atonement theory. And so we want to look at this um, more closely here, what this uh, means here for us. Why did Jesus die? Why was he crucified? So um, in the long run here, it's we're trying to answer that question ultimately of how does Jesus's death make him our savior? What good did he do with this way? Now, the most obvious answer is one that Jesus himself gives in John Mark 10, 42 to 45. The disciples have been arguing about who's the greatest among them. And Jesus says, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For, and here's the important line in 1045, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That word ransom right there is sort of the key. And this is the verse that is explaining in some way, why did Jesus have to die, be killed, be crucified? to give his life a ransom for many. And we want to be thinking about that as we continue on in this session here. Now, at his death itself, if you remember, um, as the darkness came over the land, he cries out with this loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, a sort of Hebrew Aramaic, which means, my God, my God, have you, why have you forsaken me? And, and this seems a very... Uh, dire and, and horrible, tragic way that Jesus is dying here, um, wondering about whether God has forsaken him. Uh, but Mark continues this on here because Jesus gives his loud cry, his breathed his last. And as we've noted before, that schizomai verb of the, of the temple curtain being torn in two from top to bottom is the way that uh, connects it back to the heavens being opened at the baptism. And so somehow all of this is being framed uh, very nicely by the gospel of Mark to help us see this is all part of God's plan uh, that's happening here. 
And it gets confirmed then when the centurion who stood facing him, saw it in this way, he breathed his last. He said, truly, this man was God's son. So the question here is, what did the centurion see? Because if you look there, he didn't see the temple curtain opening. He couldn't see that. Uh, he didn't know apparently much about Jesus at all. And instead, as he is uh, simply seeing this Jewish pe for person horribly suffering and dying and crying out in some loud way, somehow that is what lets him understand that uh, Jesus was God's son. So what did the centurion see? And in another way we could put this in is our, as ourselves, as readers of Mark Gospel, what did you see? What did you see in Jesus's crucifixion here that makes this all make sense? And so that old hymn is, is actually quite good. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Mark, in telling his story, has wanted you to be there and help you to see what's important about this scene. Now, to ask then this question about what did Jesus's death accomplish? What did his crucifixion, how did that make him our savior? I'm gonna come at it in a little different way. I'm gonna uh, work with a, a theologian named um, Paul Tillich and uh, John Douglas Hall, Douglas John Hall. Um, uh, they're looking at this, not just as you're saved, but to think about what you're saved from. And there's sort of a chronological sequence of things here. And I'll start out, um, the earliest thing that they want to, that they suggest is that when life is unpredictable and unmanageable, think of in Jesus's own time, right? Um, medicine um, was not nearly anything like we have today. How could you control uh, the weather, pre pre protect yourself against the weather and, and earthquakes, all these things. When life is unpredictable and manageable, death and fate are the biggest things, the problems that confront you. Those are the things that you worry about. Now, as life becomes more predictable and manageable, and picture yourself now in the time, for example, of Luther in the 16th century, um, the start of the enlightenment is happening here and new inventions are being made and medicine is getting better and uh, building everything, all these things are getting better and better. And now things are more predictable and you can, uh, life expectancy is increased and now it isn't so much death and fate as guilt and condemnation. Remember, that was one of the main motivating factors for Luther himself was this overwhelming sense of guilt. Had he done enough? Uh, what more should he be doing? How could he, how could he account for all the bad that he had done in his own life? So guilt and condemnation were the things that were weighing most on people's minds. And the church was responding to that in both good and bad ways. And part of Luther's whole, in a, Luther's whole understanding of saved by grace through faith was a powerful way of addressing this guilt and condemnation. But what about today? Life is fairly predictable for the most part, and for most of us, I know it's we can't generalize for the whole world that way, and, and for many people that um, are struggling to survive every day, but for the most part, we all consider ourselves to be fairly stable as we watch our internet Bible study like this. We have wonderful uh, health options available to us. Uh, life expectancies have a lengthened. Uh, we can deal with a pandemic at least, or we're trying to do vaccinations. All these kinds of things are possible. And we can manage things for the most part. We now, um, our bigger concerns are mainly managing retirement portfolios. Um, how are we going to spend our free time? All those kinds of things come together. And when that is happening, then the big problem becomes not death and fate, not guilt and condemnation. And you look around today and you wonder whether there's guilt around at all anymore. Um, I, guilt certainly does not seem to be a, a way that people are responding. Rather, meaninglessness and despair is the problem. Why are we here? What's it all for? What is the purpose of my own life? Why should I care about anything? Um, what's the goal beyond simply having eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die as if that's simply the way things are going to go? Now, what are the responses to these here? 
um, what are we saved for is the other way to look at this. Not what we're saved from, but what are we saved for? And let me try to hook these two together here. And perhaps a beautiful way that Paul put it in Galatians there was for freedom. Christ has set us free, and it's free from those things I've just mentioned. So freedom from the power of death and fate grants us to live life abundantly. I'm bringing in Johannine language here, but it's the sense of an experience of eternal life right now, of being able to see the bigger picture, to see how it is that God has been working in Christ, working throughout all of history, working in our own lives as well. That's what abundant life is about. And we also are get receive freedom from guilt. That's what the forgiveness of sins is all about. And what does that do? It grants us to live by grace. Rather than having to always be self-centered upon ourselves, whether always being focusing on whether we've done enough or haven't done enough or have done the wrong things and all this kind of stuff. Now we are truly free free to be able to share, to serve, uh, to live for others in all these kinds of ways, because we live by grace now. We have that wonderful freedom. And finally, then the freedom from despair and meaningless, when we understand that big picture of what God has done for us in Christ, grants us to live for Christ and others in friendship and service. We truly do become uh, servants in the world ourselves, just like Christ. And this isn't natural for so many people, right? Um, there's that self-centeredness. There's always that concern looking out for number one. Um, these are no longer our concerns. We are freed from those concerns. So that's what I'm thinking. Um, I'm proposing here and drawing on some great theologians to think about what we're freed from and even more importantly, what we're freed for. Now, how does this all work? This is where we get into these theories of atonement I'd mentioned earlier when we tried to address that question directly of why did Jesus die? Why was he killed? Why was he crucified? And the first one, and the perhaps the most ancient one that we see, is what might be called the Christus Victor. Um, it really draws on that ransom theme that we saw before. And what Mark is perhaps the clearest example of this, that Jesus's ministry is a battle with evil uh, from the very outset. After he is baptized, he goes into the wilderness and is tested by Satan. And he gets accused of being, um, whether he is working with Satan or not throughout his ministry. And people are constantly challenging him that way. And finally, at the end, uh, uh, at his crucifixion, it looks as if evil has won. But is that the case? In his death, we see that evil is not overcome with evil. And we also see how God's ultimate victory is assured in Jesus's resurrection. Paul plays on this uh, theme as well here, where it really is almost as if you picture a battle scene and evil thinks that it is won when it is finally crucified and killed and buried Jesus, only to discover three days later that Jesus has risen from the dead, and it actually is God who has the ultimate victory, Christus victor. Christ is the one who is the victor, who overcomes death and the grave, and all these things that, we're, that we say that we are afraid of, that we need to be saved from. So Christus Victor, and if you want some modern examples of what that might look like, you might be familiar with these, those of you who know C.S. Lewis and the Narnia series. Uh, remember, Aslan is that great lion that is so fearful and awesome, um, but in the story, it allows itself to be killed, and all these evil forces that have been plotting against Aslan um, triumph, and they think they're all, they're having a big celebration, and those who have been followers of Aslan are completely distraught, only discover that Aslan returns. Uh, C.S. Lewis, in writing that story, was drawing on, on the Christus Victor model. But it shows up in po other ways in popular cultures. Uh, some of you may recognize Obi-Wan Kenobi there in the Star Wars uh, series. Remember how he allows himself to be killed? And somehow when you think, well, that's the end of it, There's, is there any hope? He somehow is an ongoing presence in the story. These are the ways that this powerful um, work of a 
of the Christus Victor of the ransom sort of theory um, works out and can help us to appreciate uh, what Jesus has accomplished. But that's not the only way. Uh, most people today, I suspect, are more familiar with what's called the sacrificial or the substitutionary theory of atonement. And by this, it's God is the king, things have gone bad, uh, people have sinned against the king, people have not paid their debts up, God demands justice. And Jesus's death was a sacrifice to repay the debt or bear the punishment that we deserved. So Jesus suffers on our behalf, and as God, as that divine being, Jesus can pay God back, but as human, Jesus pays on our behalf. Now, as I say, this is a very uh, popular way of looking at it. It's probably the most common way today. Um, it arises a little bit out of the old Jewish sacrificial system, uh, where sacrifices were made at the temple that way. Um, but there's some problems with this that people get uncomfortable because on the one hand, if God can do anything, why does God have to demand uh, this repayment? Can't God simply declare, declare forgiveness? And if, if Jesus is God, doesn't this seem a little bit as if God is uh, saying, you owe me money and pulls out a wallet and pays, puts money from one pocket into another as if, if, if Jesus is doing that. Um, and, and this is also seems a very, almost in a way, a cruel God that, uh, that demands this justice, that demands a death in order to repay things. The thing is, it makes such good sense. Um, we like to think of, uh, especially today in our day and age, we think of things in balance. And when we think of justice, we really think of fairness probably more than anything. And so on the one hand, you've got uh, the balance of the world sins uh, weighed off against the sacrifice of Jesus. And some very famous theologians in antiquity have tried to play on this. Anselm uh, talks about how Jesus is repaying honor to God, or Aquinas. Uh, these have become a very important uh, figures in Roman Catholicism. Jesus pays the penalty for the original sin, but according to Aquinas, we need to pay for the rest. So there's this initial grace that we get, but then somehow we have to do more, which I'm not finding uh, particularly comforting. Calvin talks about how Jesus was punished for all our sins, and it's that whole sort of idea coming out of Calvinism that led into the, the um, early American uh, preacher, Jonathan Edwards, uh, who was famous for his preaching about who that we are sinners in the hands of an angry God. Now, as I say, this makes sense. This has been a very prominent theme, especially in uh, more modern Christianity. Um, but maybe you can sense the problems with this. Is God really angry with us? Is that how we perceive God? There's another way. Um, this one might be called the exemplary uh, theory of atonement. And by that, Jesus is, is the example of either God's love for us, he, he exemplifies that, but he also exemplifies our need to be faithful to God. So it's a sort of two-way street there. Jo Jesus then becomes both example and inspiration for us. Now, that's another nice way to look at this. You no longer have an angry God. It's very uh, powerful this way, and it probably came out most commonly in that phrasing. Uh, you might have remembered the WWJD, right? What would Jesus do? Um, on the one hand, this really is a powerful motivation um, that uh, we would try to emulate Jesus, follow his example, and that's certainly a good thing. Um, on the other hand, um, we are not called to be Jesus. And Jesus is more than an inspirational speaker. Um, we really are more interested not in trying to figure out what would Jesus would do so that we would do it, but we want to actually, I think, celebrate more about what Jesus has done for us um, to set us free. So I'm, there's, again, this is another helpful way to think about what Jesus accomplished, um, but we want to think about where its limitations are. Another way that I'll give to you, and this is probably most prominent in the Gospel of John, an incarnational mode, where Jesus's whole life is a demonstration of God's love for us. That is, by becoming one of us, human, incarnating, becoming in the flesh, as John likes to talk about, um, that in doing so, Jesus is God's love present among us, and his death shows that this love is greater than even death. 
Now that's a very encouraging word again. And you can see how powerful that is. And that's uh, pictured in, in these uh, um, um, uh, pic depictions of the crucifixion of Jesus. Um, I've zoomed in here. This is a picture of the Grunewald um, uh, artist, Grunewald, who did this uh, altarpiece at Eisenheimer Monastery. And his depiction of Jesus on the cross uh, shows Jesus with these uh, scars all over his body. The monastery was for those for uh, ergotism, was the name of this disease that people were suffering from, that there wasn't a good way to deal with it. And so here, Jesus. Um, Grunewald has captured it, that Jesus bears that suffering in his, his own body as well. He identifies with us and is here to save us. So that's another good way to take a look at this. Um, and it is very powerful. I'll give you one more, and it's one that I'm particularly interested in thinking about, and that's called the scapegoat theory of atonement. Um, it comes from Leviticus 16, and you might want to read that. It's a theory, uh, it's, a, it's an event that happened annually uh, where two uh, goats were chosen, and one um, was sacrificed, and the other one, it was as if the sins of all the people were put on that, that goat, and that goat was driven out into the wilderness. That's where we get this language of scapegoat from, that the one who who gets blamed for everything. And by chasing it out into the wilderness to um, out there, you are taking away the sins of all the people here. Now, why this is so powerful is I think because it's based on something that we all really understand about life. Let's imagine we're in a community and everything is at peace. Everything is going well. Will that peace last forever? Human history has shown over and over again that peace never lasts. There's always controversy. There's always something that happens. And so there's troubles arise, right? So when the troubles arise, now what's going to happen? How do people respond? And how do especially um, uh, ambitious leaders respond? They respond by identifying a scapegoat. And they're saying, okay, I know what our problem is. It's this. It's that. And it, the most clear example would be perhaps in Nazi Germany, where it was identified as uh, the Jews and these other people, marginal people, that they said, that's our problem. If we only get rid of those, if we get these scapegoats and drive them out of here, then everything will be better. We continue to do it all the time, whether it's the way we talk about uh, uh, foreigners or whether we talk about uh, uh, the capitalists or the socialists or whatever. If, when we don't feel at peace, we look for someone to blame. And the thing is, the reason why it keeps happening, because it's somewhat successful. Uh, Nazi Germany was able to start a whole war and almost could have won um, over the whole thing by the way that they came at it. People are willing to uh, so often do the scapegoat. And so when you purge them out here, uh, the thing is, it seems to work. Things get better for a while and everybody feels great. We have got peace again. But of course, you know the problem here. What happens? The peace falls apart. You once again come rise new kinds of troubles. You've got to find a new scapegoat. And it's this endless cycle. And if you look at all of human history, you could you could chart it on a, on a diagram like this of, of nations and countries and communities and peoples and families even always going through this cycle, this endless cycle of finding peace, discovering trouble, finding something to blame, purging that, and then trying to restore some peace and balance. Now, how does this apply to Jesus here? The thing is, in most scapegoat situations, you don't hear from the scapegoats again, they're gone. But with Jesus, here he is, someone who's innocent. He has nothing to blame for this. We can't escape the sin that we have done in killing Jesus, the son of God. And if you remember the Arnold Schwarzenegger thing, you sort of would be like, I'll be back and figure that if the scapegoat that we have now killed, came back even more powerful than before, we're all in huge trouble. And this new powerful person who comes back is going to wreak havoc and revenge and continue on this cycle and create a new a cycle of power. But what happens with Jesus instead, 
he's resurrected. But when he comes back, the first word that he says to his disciples, if you look in Luke and the Gospel of John, the resurrection parents is the first word he says to them is peace. This is the scapegoat who comes back, but instead of bringing vengeance and justice in the sense of uh, punishment, he brings peace. And that peace that Jesus declares, that Jesus brings, breaks that cycle of violence so that no longer are we caught up in that. There's now become a new way of understanding ourselves and of the world. It's a new community that Jesus is creating that's founded on the peace that he brings. So um, one, two, three, four, five, five different ways to think about um, what Jesus accomplished in his crucifixion here. And it's not to say that one of them is right and the others are wrong. All of these have biblical warrant. All of these have been drawn upon by, by theologians and Christians throughout the centuries. But think again here, the Christus figure, the, Rick, the ransom one, talks about how Jesus dies instead of us. The sacrificial one, how Jesus dies for us. The exemplary one, which is really kind of a moral theory, uh, Jesus dies to show us a better way, um, which is good again, but I think that's limited. The incarnational um, talks about how Jesus dies with us, and it has the hope that we rise with him. But the scapegoat, or really you might call it the anti-scapegoat thing, is that Jesus dies to transform us. And for me, I really find that to be the most powerful sort of way that I understand what Jesus has done. It's not that he's just made things better, he's changed things. And in changing the world, he changes us. We are transformed to think about life in a new way. Because due to his crucifixion, Think about how that affects us. Why is it important to us? It's because it means that we also have been marked with that cross, brought into a new community of peace. And that means then as well that we have been marked for life. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Mark. Now we will sing our hymn. together. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the day, especially for the good we were permitted to give and to receive. The day is now past and we commit it to you. We entrust to you the night. We rest securely, for you are our help and you neither slumber nor sleep. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now receive God's blessing. You are what God made you to be, created in Christ Jesus, chosen as holy and beloved, 
free to serve your neighbor. God bless you that you may be a blessing. In the name of God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to serve, marked by the cross of Christ forever. Amen. Thanks be to God. Thank mm-hmm. you.